Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. And, Wes, the Packers lose a tough one in Minneapolis, a walk-off field goal, 34-31. to The Vikings emerge triumphant. And this one, for me, just came down to the fact that you know it's very difficult in this league to play defense week after week after week at the level the Packers have been playing it. You're going to run into a hot offense at some point. And that's what happened to the Packers on Sunday. But they also had their opportunities on defense to stem the tide, to create those, to get those turnovers that would have uh, potentially changed the complexion of this game. And the bottom line is the defense just didn't take advantage of those opportunities. No, I mean, this is the perfect uh, embodiment, Mike, of what we've talked about all season when, you know, certain things weren't working well for the offense. The defense really picked them up. Yep. This was a game in which, you know, I, first and foremost, before we talk about any miscues, any problems, any issues there, at some point, you also need to tip your cap to Kirk Cousins. I thought he played one of the best games I've seen him play in a Vikings uniform against Green Bay. Yep. He was surgical. They threw everything at him. He was facing a lot of heavy pressure throughout the game. And in those instances, he found his hot read. He found some, you know, the ways to keep the, you know, the chains moving. And then when he did have time to throw, he really made the Packers pay for it. So you got to give him credit. But defensively for Green Bay, it was one of these games, Mike, where they did stop Delvin Cook for the most part. They did really keep them in third and manageable situations. But when they needed to convert, the Vikings did it. They were 26th, I think, in the league on third downs coming in this game, and then they converted like 7 of 11. Justin Jefferson went off. There were some issues in the defensive secondary trying to get some of those things under wraps. And ultimately, in this kind of shootout that it turned into, Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings won the day. Yeah, it was interesting because we talked a lot last week about how about the great season Cousins was having, the fact that he'd only thrown two interceptions all year. And yet he gave the Packers opportunities for three, four, maybe five, depending on how you want to look at it, how you want to grade it. He gave the Packers chances with some very risky, questionable throws. And the Packers just didn't come down with the ball, unfortunately. And, and you know, th- those, are, those are the moments, you know, these, game, these games are decided by those big plays and the clutch moments, right? And yeah. we talked about how in Arizona the Packers' defense was on its heels in the second half and Kyler Murray was rolling. And what happened? Rasul Douglas caught the ball in the end yep. zone for the interception. Packers had a similar opportunity, multiple opportunities, against Kirk Cousins and uh, and simply weren't able to convert. And unfortunately, that rendered a tremendous performance by Aaron Rodgers on a sore, painful toe, um, an offense missing Aaron Jones, um, a tremendous performance by the Packers' offense in which they put up 31 points despite a very slow start to the game. But boy, when Green Bay's offense got rolling in this one, Minnesota could not stop Aaron Rodgers. No, I mean, with the exception of Jordan Love kneeling down before halftime, that was the only time there was really a stop uh, past that Josiah DeGuara 25-yard touchdown. I mean, Rodgers just got into a zone, and I thought that was really emblematic of what happens when, while Alan Lazard wasn't playing, he did have a full array of his weapons. I mean, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, with a, a healthy hamstring uh, against any NFL secondary is a really dangerous proposition, and Rodgers got going with him late. Obviously, the 75-yarder is the one that we're going to talk so much about, but there were some of those passes even early on where you could see that the, the spark, how this offense looks different when MVS is healthy and, and contributing. Devontae Adams, despite seeing a lot of cover too, was able to have a successful day, was back to being a serious red zone, end zone type threat in this game and realistically Mike the way I look at this thing is Green Bay put up 467 total yards of offense Minnesota put up 408 total yards of offense defensively if that's how much you know production you're going to give up you either need to take the ball away or you need to play clean completely clean three-phase football and Green Bay didn't do enough of that there was the the 32-yard miss from Mason Crosby, as you mentioned, not being able to get those turnovers when you needed them. And when you play an even game like that and both sides are producing, 
nine times out of ten, it's going to end up favoring whoever that home team is, and in this case, the team that held the ball last. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers ends up with 385 passing yards, four touchdowns, a 148.4 passer rating. All of those are season highs for 2021. And if you're looking for some reasons for optimism coming out of the loss, I mean, that's what you hang your hat on here if you are the Packers because you mentioned it, Lazard wasn't playing, Aaron Jones wasn't playing, but yet this Packers offense found itself in high gear. The contributions from MVS, from Josiah DeGuara, from EQ St. Brown in this game, those are the types of things that could really bode well here for the Packers down the stretch if, uh, if Aaron Rodgers is able to, to create big explosive plays using so many different guys. Right. I 100% agree. I think the other thing Green Bay needs to hang its hat on is consistency. Minnesota's been a wildly inconsistent team this year. That's why they're 5-5. Five and five. Right. That's just the facts. Exactly. You know, yes, they've led in every game. Yes, they've only lost by more, but you're still 5-5. Five and five. So for Green Bay's standpoint, you're 8-3. and three. And yes, we're going to talk about some injuries here in a minute, unfortunately, but Green Bay has been able to consistently produce throughout the course of the year, and it's why they have this lead that they have right now in the NFC North. The big key for them, Mike, I think is going to be where they finish this game offensively. They still want to run the ball more. I would have liked to have seen A.J. Dillon get a few more than 11 carries in this. I thought he was an impact player when he had the ball in his hands. But they were able to get the downfield passing game going again and in must-win situations, not just, hey, let's just see what happens here. I mean, they needed every single one of those four touchdown drives in order to compete, in order to be in this game. And I feel like going forward now, especially if MVS gets through this game okay, especially if you get Lazard back, you're going to start to see those perimeter weapons emerge for Green Bay and allow them to kind of start looking more like themselves offensively. Yeah, absolutely. And as much as we've talked about, Wes, over the course of this season, how the Packers seem to have had some costly victories in terms of players who got hurt when the Packers emerged victorious, this one, the Packers lost much, much more than just one game with Pro Bowl offensive lineman Elton Jenkins unfortunately being down for the season now um, due to a knee injury. And uh, once again, this, uh, you know, this Green Bay offensive line is going to ha have to shuffle things around. You were hoping, everybody was hoping that at some point this season, that left side of the offensive line was going to be David Bakhtiari at left tackle and Elton Jenkins at left guard, and you were going to be able to re-entrench those high-level, elite-level players at their positions for the stretch run. And unfortunately, that's not going to happen now. Um, a, a really, really unfortunate injury with Jenkins and, and things with David Bakhtiari still up in the air. The Packers still believing he's going to be able to come back at some point this season and help out, but things are still on hold there as he is not on the practice field. No, it sucks. It sucks for Elton. And um, I don't know, man. It, it, it hurts that for everything Bakhtiari and Jenkins accomplished together. Uh, the fact that that December 31st practice is the last time we're going to see them on the field together now for at least another year, probably, or yeah. at least in their abodes. Right. Um, if this is the type of injury that I think everybody fears it is for Elton. And the guy has been so selfless this year. And what stands out to me the most, Mike, we don't get to be in the locker room anymore, at least at this point. But him being up at the podium, just seeing Elton Jenkins' personality come out more yeah. as a guy that's a third-year vet now and seeing the playfulness and, you know, the photos that I know he took with the, with the portraits with Bakhtiari before the season. The, the definition of growing comfortable in your own skin, yeah. right? I mean, that's, that's what we've seen and he's, over he's these last He's always been years. such a nice dude oh, yeah. since day yeah. one he came in. But just listen to him talk and the way he speaks about his game and that there just was so much more... I don't want to say charisma because that's not the right word, but just confidence with how he carried himself. And to see him play it the way he did, Mike, as I've said time and time again, it should not have been this easy to go 11 games without David Bakhtiari. Right. And for eight of those, Elton Jenkins was the big reason why. So to see him go down with this and the scenario that it did, I, I know it's a polluted mindset. I know Mike McCarthy would probably say I'm a loser, but <laughs> you almost just wish you could go back, just forfeit the darn game and then just go on to the, the Los Angeles Rams with Jenkins still intact. I mean, it was that type of loss. So Green Bay has been really resilient on their offensive line. Yash Nyman, I think the Packers coaching staff, has to feel a lot more confident right now than probably they were two months ago when he had to sub in there for three games. But 
But still, they got to get Bakhtiari back. I mean, if they want to make a big run here, you need to get the five-time All-Pro back. And now without Jenkins, that is becoming more and more evident. Yeah, it's really remarkable here that we're talking about the Packers heading into Thanksgiving weekend and the starting five across the front going left to right is going to be Nyman, Runyon, Patrick, Newman, and Turner. And take nothing away from those guys. I, th- this, this is a unit that can get the job done. There's no question about that. These guys have all proven it. But when you look at what the Packers were hoping they were going to have at this point of the season where you're talking about, you know, obviously Jenkins, but Josh Myers, your rookie center, who was so promising and, and getting Bakhtiari back at some point. Suddenly now that offensive line you envisioned, three-fifths of it is, is not available here for what is going to be a really significant game against the Los Angeles Rams. The Packers at 8-3, and three, the Rams at 7-3. and three. The Rams coming off their bye week and on a two-game losing streak, and they're looking to reassert themselves as a top NFC contender. Yeah, and, and the point I think that you're kind of alluding to, too, is the fact that when the Packers return back for the offseason program at the end of April there, I think basically we can all agree one of those guys that you just mentioned, Billy Turner, was considered a starter. Runyon, Patrick, and Newman were going to get an opportunity to compete for a starting spot, but Turner was the only one that you kind of had written in Sharpie. Yeah. So to be in a position now where they've been very blessed with depth, I mean, how many times have we talked about depth and versatility with this group? And it's still a really good offensive line. But now it's like this is where you start to remember why they signed Dennis Kelly. This is where you start to remember about how they've developed Jake Hansen over the last year because now the next men up behind the next men, it's starting to become more of a real probability, possibility of them potentially having to step in at some point. You just hope at, at, at some juncture of this season, the injury thing is just going to calm down and hopefully maybe week 13 and that bye is going to be the beginning of that. Yeah, that would sure be nice. This, this Packers team has been waiting for that bye week to get here. To, to, have to, play, to have to play 12 games in this league without a bye week is a really tough task. And I know the Packers, in a sense, did it. I forget if it was last year or the year before where they had the early buy and then, you know, you go all the way through that and into the postseason. Um, although the Packers then would, you know, had a buy in the playoffs. Yeah. So it was like they, they got the buy there in, uh, um, in early January, but it's, uh, but it's tough. It's a brutal game. And, uh, um, you know, unfortunately the, this, uh, this injury epidemic, so to speak, of the 2021 season for the Packers just doesn't seem to uh, to want to stop. Some word for our sponsors here, Wes. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs. We believe in better. All right, taking a look at the big picture here, the Minnesota Vikings have climbed within two and a half games of the Packers in the NFC North. Green Bay at eight and three, Minnesota at five and five. In the NFC as a whole, Arizona has jumped back on top into that number one spot at nine and two. Hats off to the Cardinals. They've lost their quarterback for three games, and Colt McCoy has won two of those as Kyler Murray's backup. So that is why Arizona is 9-2, and two, despite plenty of injuries of their own, significant ones. And then right behind the Packers at 8-3, and three, you have three teams that are 7-3, and three, and I'm talking about, of course, the Rams, who are coming into Lambeau on Sunday, as well as the Dallas Cowboys and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This is five teams, Wes, uh, any one of whom, quite frankly, could end up with that coveted number one seed and first round bye in the NFC. This is six or seven games to go, depending on uh, um, you know the, the bye week situation. But six or seven games left, and this is wide open for that top spot in the conference. Yeah, because I think all those teams you mentioned have been fallible. Uh, they've been human. Uh, Dallas, the, the fervor out of Dallas right now isn't great after Kansas City, who was much maligned for some time, has sort of reignited. 
You look at suddenly Kansas City is winning with defense, by yeah. the way. I mean, yes, they had one big game from Patrick Mahomes out of these last three or four, but Kansas City Chiefs are playing some really, really good defensive football, and that's what uh, looks like is going to catapult the Chiefs in into the AFC playoffs. Yeah, could have played eight quarters. You don't know if Dallas is going to be able to find the end zone in that game. I mean, that's <laughs> the way that that's how dominant they were. It felt yeah. a lot like that Seattle game for Green Bay, but yeah, you know, you look at the Los Angeles Rams, they got Odell Beckham, and they're feeling really good about themselves, and then they had some letdowns. The real big interesting thing about the way this lined up, though, for Green Bay this week is they're going to be facing a rested Rams team, and they're really hurting. So, you know, I think this is really going to be incumbent on Matt LaFleur keeping these guys up for one more week and saying we have one more focus here to try to get that ninth win here before the bye week and be able to give ourselves a little bit of a break. Uh, because you have to imagine Sean McVay is going to be sending the same, the, the opposite message to his guys out in Los Angeles. If you guys are rested, you're going up against a, a beaten and battered kind of Green Bay crew here. And seeing those two things come together is going to be really interesting to watch. But it is. Both conferences right now, Mike, it is going to be a sprint to the finish with the way that this thing is lined up. Yeah. You look at the Rams season, I know we'll talk more about them on our next show uh, later this week, but... You look at their season and the way they just seem to be absolutely rolling offensively. And then suddenly, against the Titans and against the 49ers, they score 16 and 10 points, respectively, in those two games heading into their bye week. And you wonder, was the, was was this a team that was also sort of dying to get to yeah. their bye, to get yeah, to their Yeah, and then they lost Robert well. Woods. They, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they lost Robert Woods, and Beckham came in, but hadn't practiced much, obviously. So, you know... The it's just it's just the way this league works sometimes, right? And and I don't want to over dramatize it, but when you look at the fact that you have this big game against the Rams on Sunday at Lambeau Field, and then the Packers are finally going to get to their bye week, and the Packers will either be nine and three or eight and four, those two records just look will look and feel so different, right? Yeah. Depending on depending on which one the Packers fall into. Well, and the fact you have to think about it, you know, for that extra seven days, uh, you don't <laughs> yeah. get a chance to turn the page like you usually do. Um, and that's the interesting part with the Rams, though, too, yeah. the fact that they were seven and one and then suddenly lost two straight and then had this whole extra week to stew over, yeah. you know, losses that really, really frustrated. Yeah, and them. the landscape's a lot different in that conference, in that division where you got the Arizona Cardinals kind of just keeping their heads above water here, hoping they can get Kyler Murray back while still being at the top of the conference. So, right. it, it again, every season has its built-in challenges. I'm really eager to watch how this team adapts to it. Um, you know, you would hope if it's not this week, it'll be after the bye, you get Aaron Jones back. You know, same situation with Alan Lazard. If you get Bakhtiari back in the fold, and then obviously the, the two biggest carrots, the, the gold at the end of the rainbow here, if they can get him back, is Jair Alexander and Zadarius Smith. That, I think, can be uplifting for them if they can find a way to get healthy, if they can turn off the faucet with these injuries. Yeah, you talk about a potential infusion of energy you know, for a stretch run when you're in this highly, highly competitive and contested, no matter what happens in the NFC North, but looking at the conference as a whole, how highly contested this is, that type of infusion of energy from big-time players potentially coming back and rejoining your lineup, that, that's promising. I, I think back to 13 with Aaron Rodgers and Randall Cobb coming back. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you get... You you start to get that type of ability back in your locker room, back on the field, uh, it, it can't help but be a galvanizing moment. But again, you have to earn it. You have to earn it with a, guy, a bunch of guys here this upcoming week that probably weren't viewed as main contributors at the beginning of the season. So it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be one of the biggest they've faced all season. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we will talk more about the Rams, as I said, on our next show. For now, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team all week long. We'll have it for you on Packers.com. For Wes, I'm Mike. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time.